bothering them about their so-called privilege. You're male, you're privileged. Imagine that. Try to imagine an unhealthier, unhappier life than that. So a lot of young men in America are going nuts. Are you surprised? And by the way, a shockingly large number of them have been prescribed psychotropic drugs by their doctors, SSRIs or antidepressants. And that would include quite a few mass shooters. And keep in mind, again, these drugs are meant to prevent crazy behavior. And yet there seems to be a connection. Eric Harris, the Columbine killer, was in both Zoloft and Luvox. A year earlier, a 15-year-old called Kip Kinkle shot his parents and dozens of classmates. He was on Prozac. In 2005, a 16-year-old called Jeff Wiesa killed his grandfather and 10 kids in Minnesota. He was on Prozac, too. So was 27-year-old Stephen Kamerzak, who murdered six people at Northern Illinois University. In 2012, you may recall, when 25-year-old James Holmes walked into a movie theater and shot 82 people. He was on Zoloft. The list goes on and on and on and on. It includes the shooter at the Washington Navy Yard in 2013. That would be 34-year-old Aaron Alexis. It also includes Dylan Roof. He's the 21-year-old who shot up the church in Charleston. Now, he was apparently a racist, and we've heard a lot about that. Fine. But we've heard next to nothing about the fact that he was taking SSRIs, he and many, many others. You're not supposed to notice, but some have. The Journal of Political Psychology once assembled a list of dozens more mass killings all committed by young people, young men, on prescription drugs. So is there a connection? Well, we don't know definitively. We do know there are a whole lot more of these drugs being taken by kids than ever before. And by the entire population, who's not taking some prescription medication at this point? Between 1991 and 2018, total SSRI prescriptions in the United States rose by more than 3,000%. 3,000%. 3,000% of anything is a massive change. You don't see changes like that. But the point of this change was to make Americans calmer, saner, happier. Take these drugs and your problems will go away. Yes, you will become numb. You will lose part of yourself. You no longer experience deep joy. You'll become part robot, but at least you won't want to kill yourself or harm other people. That was the promise. 3,000%. Did it work? Let's see. Over the very same period, the suicide rate in the United States jumped by 35%. Did it work? Well, millions of people got on anti-suicide drugs and we wound up with many more suicides. So maybe it's not working. Is it possible it's making the problem worse, you think? Well, let's see, mass shootings also increased dramatically over the very same period. Here's a chart that shows it. Now the half what's on Twitter always scream the same thing. <laughs> Correlation is not causation. All right, whatever that means. But tell us half what's, what is going on exactly? What, what does that chart mean? We know that SSRIs are dangerous. It says so right on the label. They increase, quote, the risk of anxiety, agitation, irritability, hostility, aggressiveness, impulsivity, and mania. Oh, not a big deal. That's not causation. Then what is it? According to one meta study by the FDA, young people who've been prescribed SSRIs have an increased rate of suicide. Oh, wait, more suicide? Weren't they supposed to reduce suicide, but we're getting more suicide? Let's, let's stop right there. But we're not stopping. We're accelerating. Between 2015 and 2019, the use of SSRI drugs by teens in the United States rose by nearly 40%. So it's not working. Let's do a whole lot more of it. This seems like a massive and extremely obvious problem. Extremely obvious. People aren't themselves. They're taking drugs that are, appear to be causing the behavior the drugs are designed to prevent. Why don't they talk about this on TV? Oh, let's see. In 2020, the pharmaceutical industry spent more than $4.5 billion advertising on national television in this country. Now, how much is that? Well, to put it in some context, Pfizer spent more on advertising in 2020 than it did on research and development. But it wasn't a bad decision. It was a great decision. Pfizer's revenue doubled last year to more than $81 billion. Now, how'd they do that? Well, the ad campaign paid off. It helped convince politicians to require the entire population to take Pfizer products. Products that don't work as advertised, that have killed large numbers of people, and whose side effects are indemnified against lawsuits by the United States Congress. That's quite a business model. You might think it could be a subject of a media story. But no, no stories on Pfizer. They're paid to be fanboys of Pfizer, therefore they are. 
Here's a tweet, for example, from CNBC, which is ostensibly a news organization, and we're quoting. Pfizer is uniquely positioned to advance mRNA, which could be a breakthrough for other infectious diseases, genetic diseases, and cancer. Parenthesis, paid post for Pfizer, hashtag ad. <laughs> it's on their Twitter account, a news organization. They're admitting it's a paid post for Pfizer. But in CNBC's defense, they're not alone. Pretty much all the news coverage you see in the United States is a paid post for Pfizer. Watch this. Anderson Cooper 360, brought to you by Pfizer. ABC News Nightline, brought to you by Pfizer. The Human Factor, brought to you by Pfizer. CBS Health Watch, sponsored by Pfizer. Good Morning America is brought to you by Pfizer. CNN Tonight, brought to you by Pfizer. Oh, it's all brought to you by Pfizer. Now, why is